So we've discussed the various contaminants that we might find on the surfaces we're cleaning, for example, a leather seat. And now we want to discuss the chemistry of how to attack these contaminants. And in our discussion of the chemistry of cleaning, we want to talk about degreasers. What is the role of a degreaser? And more specifically about these degreasers, what is the role of pH? So we know that oil and water don't mix. So if we put water on the seat, that's not going to attack the contaminants uh, whatsoever. It's going to roll right off, isn't it? Like, uh, like water off a duck's back, as they say. So what is the role of the degreaser? Well, I found a quotation that uh, very nicely describes that. And uh, let's run that here. And it says that uh, most degreasers work on the same chemical principle. One end of the molecule in the cleaning agent has a long hydrophobic chain, which is attracted to oil and grease, and a hydrophilic end, which is attracted to water. So then even though oil and water don't mix, the degreaser allows them to shake hands, you could say. It allows them to bond together. So the water-based degreaser is now able to dissolve the oil and grease, the contaminants that are on our seat. So this is the mechanism by which degreasers attack. It's the ionic properties of the degreaser that get the job done and let us lift the contaminants off the seat and carry them away. So cleaning is not uh, left up to chance. Cleaning is the result of employing proper scientific principles, we could say. Now, what is the role of pH? That's another aspect of chemistry that comes into play here. So pH, we can find on a scale of 1 to 14. On the one end, on the acidic end, something very acidic would likely be strong enough to burn a hole through something. And on the other end of the scale, something that's extremely alkaline can also burn a hole through something. Water is going to be right in the middle. Water would be considered neutral. pH stands for the power of hydrogen, so it's related to water. Now our contaminants are going to be slightly acidic. And so we find that maybe around six on the scale. Whereas our alkaline cleaner, our degreaser, is going to be perhaps around nine. And so the objective here is for the degreaser to break down or neutralize the contaminants. And uh, that'll help us to extract the contaminants from the surface. Now, an alkaline cleaner can be made of various substances, but I find uh, through experience that the best for our industry is a butyl cleaner. And uh, my preference is the Z7 butyl cleaner uh, that's made in North Hollywood. It's available only through your supplier. And uh, what I like about this is its effectiveness, its strength. I dilute it 50-50 with water. It could even be diluted further than that. It could be one part cleaner to two parts water and still be quite effective. Now, many in our industry have been taught uh, by hand-me-down instructions to clean and prep their seats with lacquer thinner. But we can see from our discussion here already that uh, lacquer thinner is not going to provide the same functions as our degreaser. And here's a quote, an organic solvent is generally nonpolar in nature. So it's not going to have the same chemical properties as our degreaser. And because lacquer thinner is an organic solvent, it does not contain any water. It can't be measured on the pH scale, so it's not going to have any effect there either. So if you were to wipe the seat with lacquer thinner, are you going to get some cleaning? Well, accidentally, you'll get some cleaning, but you're not targeting the contaminants 
by a sound chemical principle. Now it's time to talk about the physics of cleaning, the real mechanical part of it, right? And I've put this little diagram here to demonstrate spraying our cleaner, our degreaser, onto the leather. But uh, as you'll notice, we haven't got to the leather yet because there's a contaminant layer here. And we see represented uh, uh, this droplet here that represents our water-based cleaner. The contaminant layer is that oily, dirty layer we discussed. It's a low energy surface, which means our water wants to beat up on this dirt contaminant layer. Why does the water beat up? Well, it's because of a thing called surface tension. It's the energy, the attraction of the water molecules that want to keep it from flowing out. So, given the chance, water will stay a droplet. Now, it's true that the degreaser itself wants to pull that droplet apart, but it may not be enough. The surface tension of water is very strong. And I have this quotation here I found off of the internet that says the surface tension of water is the highest of any cleaning agent available, which means it will not clean well. So if we made an index of solvents that we could use for cleaning and the wettability of these uh, liquids, water would be at the bottom of the list. Water is going to resist flowing out. And in our diagram, we call that wetting out, right? In other words, we want that droplet to flow and cover the surface as in the bottom depiction here. So the surface tension of the water is fighting against us and we have to fight back. If the surface tension is the energy that holds the water into a droplet, then we need to supply enough energy to overcome that. So we do so with a gray scuff pad and vigorous uh, arm movement, right? That's how we get the cleaning done. Now, in the depiction on the bottom of our diagram, we see a roughened surface as the result of our using the scuff pad. We've put energy into that surface. We've roughed it up. We've now turned the contaminant layer into a high energy surface. And because of that now, there's enough energy in that surface to cause this droplet to flow out. It's going to wet out over the entire surface. Then, once we have roughened the surface, we've scratched it with the scuff pad. In essence, we've sanded into that contaminant layer. Now the water can penetrate down through that layer of contaminants and it can soak in. And if we want it to soak all the way down to the leather, we need to allow dwell time. So dwell time is an important factor on a heavily contaminated surface. Now in our little demonstration that we did earlier, we didn't allow much dwell time. We sprayed our cleaner on and uh, after fumbling for a little bit with the scuff pad, we got right onto it with the scuff pad and we didn't allow much dwell time there because we had a very thin layer of uh, contaminant and we were just doing this demonstration because we wanted to show the quickest, simplest, easiest way to, uh, to attack this su superficial dirt on here. But all the same things are employed in our everyday cleaning. It doesn't matter what vehicle it is, it's all the same. It doesn't matter what surface it is, if it's plastic, vinyl, leather, it's all exactly the same process. But what we want to do is take what we've discussed so far in our discussion and let's apply this to real world scenarios. Let's look into the workplace and let's analyze, and you can analyze it along with me, some things that we have discovered and let's see if we can find the root of the problems 
on these various circumstances. Okay, here we are, straight from detailing. We see the cleaner was sprayed on the center console and on the arm. Uh, however, it didn't wet out, did it? We have individual droplets. The detailer did not spend even enough energy to overcome the surface tension of these droplets. That's pretty lazy, isn't it? Uh, no scuff pad was used. Probably a microfiber towel or a terry cloth towel was used to clean up the degreaser afterwards, but uh, to no effect uh, on the surface. There was no transfer of energy to get this work done. There was a little bit of dwell time because the droplets uh, were able to run down a little bit and uh, eat through the contaminant layer all on their own. And so the simple technique that uh, we just demonstrated on the seat is what took care of this. No problem whatsoever. This car was brought to me by the owner who had just come from a detail shop where the detailer had been detailing all his life and he was so proud that he made his own cleaner. He never bought cleaner. So what does that look like? Well, there are channels eaten into the leather here. So the pH is way too high. And uh, what about wetting out? There was no attempt to wet it out over the entire surface. Possibly that would have solved the problem. Uh, maybe because of its concentration in one area and being too high a pH and the dwell time, that's what was responsible for all of this. So the thing that I had to do is make a judgment call. I sanded with 220 and tried to even out uh, these lines, but it didn't uh, come out perfect. However, the customer was very happy that I was able to minimize the effect of it and to recolor successfully. When you look from a certain angle, you could slightly detect these channels eaten into the leather. Here we have another example of degreaser being sprayed on the seat and left in one area to drip down on its own and eat away some of the finish. Now in order to correct this, I'm doing one overall cleaning and then I'm going to make a judgment here that if I clean again and concentrate on this area where the finish is broken through, perhaps I can use the scuff pad to feather the edges of that out. And if it's not eaten into the leather, then my color coat should be able to bridge the gap here since it'll be feathered. So I'm going to wipe some color in and then spray some color on and that uh, was sufficient in this case to take care of the problem. This seat is an example from a general aviation aircraft and you can see how heavy the contaminant layer is. So it would be expected that you would clean with the degreaser and the scuff pad twice on this before you get down to the surface of the leather. And one other thing about this that this uh, illustrates to us is sometimes people will say uh, this seat just needs cleaning. Well, here's the correct response to that. We will clean the seat and then we'll discuss what it needs further because dirt hides all kinds of problems in the leather. Dirt will hide the damages. Dirt will hide wherever the color has been worn off. So don't let anyone tell you that just cleaning is going to be enough. We don't even know what the seat needs until we get that layer of contaminant off of the seat. You may find on some seats that are heavily soiled that even after you get the contaminants off the surface, there is dirt embedded into the color. Meaning that if we get even more aggressive and uh, sand a little deeper, uh, we can get some of the top coat color off uh, taking the dirt with it. 
And that's very beneficial. We might have to get more aggressive. We might have to knuckle our scuff pad in there or go to a stronger cleaner. But that way, uh, we at least get uh, a starting point that's a lot cleaner now for our color coat. Quite often we find that solvent paints are sprayed directly over top of the contaminants. So before we can go to cleaning on the seat, we have to take some solvents and remove that coating. And here just on these three little panels, I've used a pint of solvent. And we still have the rest of the seat to go. This kind of checking is what we see all the time. It's somebody picking up a can of paint and spraying it over top of the dirt. So we have to find something to strip this before we can start our cleaning process. Lacquer thinner is a pretty good choice because it's a blend of both uh, fast and slow drying solvents. Uh, pure acetone might evaporate too quickly. It doesn't have enough dwell time, perhaps, uh, to take off the finish. Toluene or xylene are slow, but maybe they're not strong enough. So we might have to experiment to see which strips the paint on each one of these jobs individually. So this involves quite a bit more work. It's very dirty. It uses up a lot of product to strip, which is expensive these days, as you know, but it's the only way to get down to the dirt layer. So now we want to talk about surface preparation. You've heard me talk about using alcohol, and I'm calling it isopropanol. You may know that by isopropyl alcohol that you can buy at the store. Uh, however, usually when it's labeled isopropyl for purchase by the public, it is a rubbing alcohol, and so it's going to have water in it. For medicinal purposes, it has to contain water. So you can find it maybe at 90% or 70% as rubbing alcohol. And since it's usually labeled isopropyl, I'm calling what we're using isopropanol simply because it has no water. It's considered 99%. And what's the advantage of that? Well, when we are cleaning up after our initial degreaser step, what's left on the seats? There's some residual degreaser, right? Which might be, if it's too heavy, it would be slimy feeling. We usually don't have it that heavy. But uh, there's residue water, residue dirt that we haven't wiped off totally. So it'd be nice to wash the area and get it nice and clean. So we use the isopropanol 99%. And that has the duty of also absorbing the water because this is what it does. Now, if we start with alcohol that has water, then it's not going to absorb as much water. But isopropanol, 99% will, it'll absorb what water, what moisture is left on the seat and cause a drying out of the surface. And so we have this quotation, the hygroscopic nature of isopropyl alcohol is very pronounced. And that's one of the reasons for using this as a prep step, because any residual degreaser, any cleaner left over, uh, this alcohol will gobble it up and uh, help you to remove it. And it leaves no residue. One of the features of isopropanol that we like is its evaporation rate. Because what we're looking for is a little bit of dwell time on our alcohol wash in order to attack the surface and convert that surface of the original leather finish into an even higher energy surface in preparation for painting. That would be advantageous, wouldn't it? So we have uh, questions uh, about various preps. 
And let's compare the solvents in this chart. We have a solvent comparison tool here. And as we notice, uh, for reference, these are based on the evaporation rate of N-butyl acetate. Now that's a solvent uh, that's, that occurs in, say, fingernail polish. In fingernail polish, you apparently want the color to flow, so you want it to be wet for a little bit of time, and then you want it to uh, finally evaporate, drying out. So they've used uh, N-butyl acetate as a value of one, and they're comparing everything to that. In other words, some solvents are going to dry faster than that, and some solvents are going to dry slower than that. So the first one we have here, the acetone, you see the evaporation rate 6.3. So it's 6.3 times as fast evaporating as N-butyl acetate. So that's pretty fast. Acetone is one of the fastest drying solvents that we'll be using in the field. So what about isopropanol? Well, we have that here further down on the chart. We, we can look over there and see it has a value of 1.7. So almost twice the uh, evaporation rate as the N-butyl acetate. Yet it's a rather slow drying uh, in, com in comparison to acetone. So it's going to dwell longer. It's going to have that effect on the coating of the seat. It's going to open it up and uh, create a higher energy surface for us. Now, some are using denatured alcohol, and we have this question sometimes. So denatured alcohol is based on ethanol. If we look up here further on the chart, we see ethanol also has a value of 1.7. So it evaporates at the exact same rate as the isopropanol. However, denatured alcohol also has methanol added to it. So if we look down here to methyl alcohol, we see that has an evaporation rate of 3.5. So that's a faster evaporating solvent mixed in with the ethanol. And that's why denatured alcohol is often used as a fuel because it has a faster evaporation rate there. Now you might uh, ask, uh, can we use rubbing alcohol all the same, you know, for prepping? Can we use it the same way as we would use the 99% isopropanol? Can we use the denatured alcohol for prepping? Yes, you can use any of those for prepping that you wish. Um, we're just showing a comparison here so you can make an informed decision on what you want to use. And so bear in mind that we do want the little bit lingering quality of the isopropanol. We want the little extra dwell time because we're aiming throughout this whole process for a high energy surface. Now, some have commented that they're not having the same results with the isopropanol as I'm having. Uh, but really, I think there's a need to be uh, brutally honest about the products you're using and the methods you're using. And this example of this repair might help you. And now, originally, the intent uh, of this video was for the customer's sake because the customer uh, wanted these dark lines gone. I explained to the customer that uh, these Black lines would be gone, but the creases would still be there. That's the quality of the leather as it's over uh, this seat cover. That's what's going to happen, the way it's built. And so we went along here, and uh, you can listen. Using the scuff pad to clean and prep with the alcohol. Now we've got a really sticky prep seat. There's no lines, of course, in here. And so we'll get a nice smooth transition with some new color in just a minute. So you saw there I was able to feather those cracked lines using the scuff pad. And I didn't have to go for any sandpaper. We made a nice transition. I wiped one coat of color in, sprayed one coat of color over top of that, and a coat of clear. 
I have one more example that uh, demonstrates the effectiveness of all of the cleaning and prep that we've been discussing so far. And while we're waiting for that job to come in, here's one of the last of the DC-11s that's still in service. What a workhorse. Now the plane that I'm waiting for has come halfway across the country. The owner wants to interview me personally, and here he's arrived. He's one of those highly intelligent individuals that's very driven, very industrious uh, personality he is. So uh, he had some, what were to him, difficult questions to pose to me, but the answers were very easy, actually. Now you might uh, ask, are you telling me that someone would bring an airplane halfway across the country primarily based on the strength of cleaning and prep. <laughs> well, you might want to sit down or hold on to something substantial because this is the story. This facility was using another franchise back about 30 years ago and uh, they were glowing in pride for their colors uh, but the plane that they had just finished on, when it got to its destination, the paint was coming off the seats in sheets. And now you know why. They didn't clean and prep. So the facility was really upset. A lot of people were angry. Uh, the plane had to come back out of service. It took another $30,000 to refurbish the plane correctly with some new leather. And uh, so the facility was done with the vendors that would come in and offer their services. So they undertook seeking someone on their own to, to fulfill what they needed done. And that's when they contacted me and uh, invited me to come in and do their work for them. So what they were looking for was somebody that would be geared toward fulfilling the basic needs with no questions asked, no excuses. And the main part of that was the humble guy that was going to clean and prep properly. Somebody that would do the basics, the meat and potatoes kind of guy that would deliver consistently and reliably. And it didn't take a uh, uh, somebody special to do that, just basically somebody that cared to do their job properly. And that's the reason that I can say, yes, they would bring a plane halfway across the country just for that. Let's quickly review some highlights of our airplane job. Here I'm able to use the cordless heat gun right before I gave it away. It gets hot enough here to loosen up this sticker. Of course, we're going to leave adhesive behind, so we'll take xylene on all the seats where the sticker residue is still there. And uh, xylene, because it has more dwell time, right? And so it loosens up the adhesive, gets that on off of there. Of course, uh, it cleans up nicely. It doesn't hurt the leather one little bit. Of course, you know, now we're going to start in with our degreaser step. We want to make sure that we get it to flow out around here. We want to wet the whole surface. And then we want to agitate all of that degreaser into the surface. The scuff pad is the means by which we get that energy transfer. Okay, well that looks pretty good. But if we go on and inspect this a little closer, we can see some dark areas. So, I wasn't as good as I thought I was. So this is what we do, we inspect every piece after we clean it and we go back and usually end up cleaning it a second time. Now this time, you can see there's some dirt down in the cracks here, down in the grain of the leather. So we will use our fingertips with a lot of pressure on that scuff pad to get down in there and see what more we can remove. 
There's color off here, of course, where it's worn, but we want to get down in this grain and get most of that dirt out of there if we can. And we did a good job this time, but it does take a, a second application quite often. These seats are pretty dirty. They get used a lot. And uh, so that looks a lot better there. Now, of course, we're going to follow up with our isopropanol. And I'm actually going to use my scuff pad to work that isopropanol in. And the reason for that is this is uh, a whitish color. And so being very light, if there's any dirt still embedded in the surface, I want it out of there. So perhaps we can take a little bit of the color with us and a little bit of the dirt too. I don't mind taking some color because we get uh, the embedded dirt, as we mentioned, along with that. And the color, of course, was put on there with a crosslinker and a clear coat also had crosslinker and slip additive. And don't forget the details, by the way. Every little detail is important. So every seat, every panel gets that same treatment. Here we keep some color back and send some color along in case there's a problem on installation. Uh, there's some ink on the sidewall. This is a ultra leather, which of course is urethane, and I'm going very carefully here using alcohol. What a nerd. And if we run out of alcohol, well, we know where we can get some more. Also, the drink rails down uh, both sides had to be touched up. Now, we don't want to do a lot of spraying in the plane any more than we have to. So with a thorough cleaning, there's almost no spraying to be done. And they thought uh, they all had to be sprayed. So what I'm doing here is touching up the black spots where the color was worn off. And any spraying we do will be to feather in these spots. And that's it. So we don't do hardly any spraying in this plane at all. And that's it for that plane. This is our final segment on cleaning and prep. We talked about uh, creating a high energy surface. And we also use the example of a low energy surface, which is polypropylene. And that's usually designated as PP on the back of the piece. We comically call that problem plastic. There are a couple things we can do to address problem plastics. One is to abrade the surface and the other is to use adhesion promoters. Now we are probably all too familiar with these GM steering wheels where the coating has peeled and beneath there we see a smooth shiny plastic. So what was not done is the plastic wasn't abraded. And this coating is fully capable of covering sanding scratches. And so when we refinish these, if we use, if we finish up, say, with 400 sanding scratches, then our coating is going to outlive the factory coating on these steering wheels. And I found this interesting. A finely abraded surface with shallow scratches created by a circular motion rather than straight lines has the best potential for a strong and persistent bond this method can create up to a 40% increase in surface area and can result in greater immediate and long-term bonding potential. Scrub pads, fine steel wool, or sandpaper can achieve the right level of abrasion. So let's talk now about adhesion promoters. What is an adhesion promoter? An adhesion promoter enhances the film adhesion by its affinity with the substrate and the liquid coating. Wetting of the liquid coating to the substrate is a key factor. In other words, we could start off with a low energy surface, but the adhesion promoter is designed to stick to even that low energy surface. Then when we paint on top of the adhesion promoter, our paint views that adhesion promoter as the high energy surface it needs. And as a result, our paint will flow out or wet out on the surface just as we had hoped. So our adhesion promoter creates a high energy surface from a low energy surface. Well, we've arrived at the end of our presentation. 
I hope that it's proved to be informative for you. And uh, I hope that as a mobile technician, you found this practical and found that it's going to help enhance your business as well. It's interesting, isn't it, uh, how energy is involved in every aspect of our cleaning and prep work. We have the energy between molecules that cements good adhesion. We have the abrading of the surface, which definitely requires energy on our part to get a good mechanical bonding. And it seems very logical, of course, that in order to change a low energy surface to a high energy surface, that would require some energy on our part to impart that energy to the piece. Where does that energy come from? Well, it comes from our arm and it gets transferred to the piece by an abrasive pad. That's the best transfer. A towel isn't going to give us a good uh, bite into the substrate. It's not going to cut as much as an abrasive pad would. And where does your arm get its energy from? Well, ultimately it's from the food that you eat. Isn't that true? And uh, the food that we eat needs to contain calories. And it needs to contain the good kind of calories. Because as this quotation says, calories are units of energy that a food or drink provides. Many good calories come from high calorie and even high fat foods. So it really is all about the eating, isn't it? I hope after enduring this video, you'll treat yourself to a good meal. <laughs> and just to close out, I don't know if you've noticed, but the ART logo features a lightning bolt that's been converted to a brush stroke. And this shows the correlation between energy and paint adhesion. Thank you for watching.